Well, we pulled some of those songs out of the archives, didn't we? <laughs> Amen. Really appreciate all of our song leaders. They do such a fantastic job getting us focused in on the Lord. If you're uh, visiting with us, uh, you've caught us right in the middle of a study series on the Temple of God. And uh, we handed out pamphlets last week, and I know everybody brought it back this week, right? Now, if you're visiting, if you're visiting or you don't have a pamphlet, please raise your hand at this point, and uh, the ushers will be passing it out. Please keep it up in the air, and uh, they'll pass it up, because this will be very important. I think it'll make it a little bit easier uh, to follow along. So uh, keep it on up right there, and uh, I think that uh, you'll, you'll be able to... Uh, Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me, how I love Him, He is risen, He is coming, Lord. Come quickly, hallelujah, 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 to practice one thing in Christianity. That's called sharing. Amen. So we don't have quite enough for everybody, so uh, make sure people can at least see a temple pamphlet right here. Last week, we studied about the revelation of the temple. Amen. Next week, we're going to study about the sanctification of the temple. But today, being Easter Sunday, we're going to talk about the celebration of the temple. Amen? Amen. Come Though many people are thinking about Jesus today, we live in a post-Christian world. Sin has been packaged as simply an alternative lifestyle. There are a plethora of churches who, like Burger King, serve up the truth your way. Humanism has taken the spirit out of the church. Mysteries, miracles, the clear manifestations of God are either belittled, ignored, or explained away by science. And yet men and women of this generation are no more fulfilled than those that were empty in the Bible times. Amen. There's absolutely no answer that man has for the sting of death. Thursday morning, I woke up and I saw on the internet a sting. I read about the Angels pitcher, Nick Adenhart, who the night before, at 22 years old, pitched six scoreless innings for the Angels. That's cranking guys at 22. Be in the starting rotation. Right after the game, he gets in a car with this young lady from Cal State Fullerton, a cheerleader, 20 years old. They're heading on off, and this drunk driver careens them, and they both die. The sting of death is strong, and this world has no answer. I want us to focus our minds here at the beginning about the things that we know are sure from the Word of God. The very prophecies of the Old Testament that testify 
to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Isaiah writes, By faith that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Matthew confirms that in his gospel. And we have to make a decision. Either the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary, and it was the very Son of God, or this was some loose woman because Joseph denied any intimate relations with her. And she just was sleeping around. Either Mary is the mother of God, or she's a loose woman. The Bible says Jesus was born of a virgin. In Genesis 49, verses 8 and 9, we find that Jesus was to be born of the tribe of Judah. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, we find that he was to be born in Bethlehem. Now, what are the chances that the Old Testament scriptures would identify not only the tribe, but the very little city that the Messiah would be born? In Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says that he would live in Egypt. What are the odds? Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, says that he would then live in Galilee. What are the odds? Zechariah 9, 9, says that he would go into Jerusalem on a donkey in triumphal procession. What are the odds? In Zechariah 11, 12 through 13, he would be portrayed for 30 pieces of silver. What are the odds? In Zechariah 12, verse 10, it says that he would be crucified and pierced for our sins. In Psalm 22, verse 18, it says that they would cast lots for his clothes. In Psalm 34, verse 20, it says there would be no broken bones. Now, the two other criminals, their bones were broken, so they died of suffocation. Amen? But Jesus died so quickly from exhaustion, his bones were not broken. What are the odds that all these prophecies would be true? And yet the most staggering and for a humanistic world, the most unbelieving prophecy of Jesus was made by Jesus himself. Turn to John chapter 2. Thanks to church, bro. In verse 18. Then the Jews demanded of Jesus, What miraculous signs can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Jesus prophesied he would raise from the dead in three days, and that is what he did. And the last time I checked the medical literature, that was impossible. Now, we need to make a decision right here. Either Jesus was a good man with a lot of moral teachings, who now has propagated a religion that has been fairly corrupted, but still has a lot of good teachings in it, like a lot of other religions, or... Jesus was the Son of God who brought us the way, the truth, and the life to know God. If you haven't studied the Old Testament scriptures out, if you hadn't examined the claims of Jesus, you need to do this. Because in Jesus, there is the hope of heaven and a relationship with God. Amen, guys? Today, we simply have two points, so I'd make it short for you on Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. Let's find out the setting for this prophecy. Let's back up a few verses right here in chapter 2, in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove off in the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he says, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous kind can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Our first point is, 
you got to clean it out to be devout. You got to clean it out to be devout. If you would, take out your pamphlet right here. And you will notice, if you examine closely, that the drawings are done by different artists and in some ways have a little bit different portrayal of the temple itself. In some ways, the one on the back, from an overview point of view, is perhaps our most accurate one. Interestingly enough, we know that the temple faced eastward. And so the temple itself was considered this whole area that has the inside wall around it. Not just the temple structure itself, but that whole area was considered the temple. The outside area is considered the court of the Gentiles. And we know from history that Herod made the temple a lot higher. It went from 45 feet high to 60 feet high. And he also expanded greatly what's called the court of the Gentiles. On the far side, you see all those colonnades right there? That would be the south side. That's called Solomon's Colonnade. That's where the early disciples gathered right there. Is that cool? First of all, there's a lot of shade and it's a little hot over there in the Middle East. Amen. <laughs> but that's where they would gather. Now, I think for a little bit better look on, on the courts themselves, turn to this particular picture right here. This one shows us inside the walls. And we find the court towards the bottom right here is the woman's court. Okay? It's called that because that's as far as the women were allowed to go. They were not allowed to go through the Nicanor Gate. In, in this area, they had 13 offering bins scattered around the edge. It's in this area that Jesus saw the widow put in her contribution to God. Now, when you see the temple structure and the next court, that next court, after you go through the Nicanor Gate, and it's pretty cool, evidently, there were 15 steps of brass that you entered through that Nicanor Gate. And then you come and you see the altar, and this area is called the court of the men, the court of the priests, and the court of the Levites. And then, of course, on a daily basis, the priests would go into the first part of the temple. So now you want to go to this picture right here. And you see the altar and the sea. See the pillars. They would enter through the temple to the holy place. And then only the high priest would enter the holy of holies or the most holy place once a year. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, when it says that Jesus cleared the temple, the area that they're talking about is the woman's court. Now, if you look at it, that's still a considerable amount of area right there. I mean, he cleared out all the animals, all the people, and his disciples are just standing on the sideline, and they can only think of one Old Testament scripture. Zeal for your father's house would consume you. I mean, Jesus was full of zeal. Amen, church? Yeah. Now, in looking at this, though, we need to come back to the scriptures and, and understand that Jesus was not at all going to allow his father's temple to be corrupted by the sins of man. Let's turn to a parallel passage in Mark chapter 11. Here we read in verse 15. Okay. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Well, right here we find one of the teachings of Jesus right after he cleared the temple. It gives his vision of what God's people need to be. He says God's people need to be called a house of prayer for all nations. And he contrasts that to the fact that 
quote, in verse 17, they had become a den of robbers. Now that's a quote from the Old Testament. And whenever there's an Old Testament quote by Jesus, he expects you to know not only where that quote is at, he expects you to know the context. Because once he says that little verse, he wants you to understand den of robbers and what was being said right there. And since some of us still have to work on our Old Testament right here, let's go over to the book of Jeremiah right now. Chapter 7, amen? amen? See, God wants you to know your Old Testament. Amen. In Jeremiah 7, we find the reference. The reference is going to be given in verse 11, but let's start reading in the middle of verse 2. Remember now, this is Jeremiah preaching. Let's see where he's at. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. So they're at the temple. So which temple is this? This is Solomon's temple, isn't it? The one that's baptized in gold. The, the extraordinarily beautiful one. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Reform your ways and your actions. And I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You see, the Israelites at this time, they prided themselves that they were, quote, Israelites, and they had God's temple that they got to go up to. And that was their security, was the temple of God. They had totally lost any consciousness of a personal relationship with God. Amen? Look what he says, verse 5. If you really change your ways and your actions to deal with the other justly, if you do not oppose, oppress the alien, the followers, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you're trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you've not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made my dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Well, you remember from 1 Samuel, the Lord decimated Shiloh and of course the ark was taken away from God's people at that time signifying that God had left his people. He says, remember what happened at Shiloh. If you don't change, if you don't clean it out to be devout, the same thing is going to happen to the temple. And in fact, it did happen. Amen, church? You know, I, I understand this scripture in Jeremiah all too well. Yesterday was a very, very, very special day for me. It was my 37th spiritual birthday. I was baptized, and you can do the math, April 11, 1972, when I was a 17-year-old freshman at the University of Florida. And at that time, though I was raised with parents that did not believe in Jesus as the Son of God, when I was 15, I'd become very religious. By 17, I was leading a Bible study for my denomination, and in a fraternity at the same time, if, if you can put those things together. <laughs> my religiosity was combined with my worldliness. And I found safety in the fact, hey, I go to church every Sunday and I lead a Bible study. <laughs> now, in my life, I was... Enslaved to lust. Enslaved to pornography. Enslaved to masturbation. Women were things. But I found safety in the temple of the Lord. At that particular time in my life, there was an expression back in those days, in, in, in the 70s, Somebody that had a lot of clothes and liked to buy nice clothes, they were called a clothes horse. That's what I considered myself. I still remember Elena's gall when I brought out my silver shirt. I used to wear these two-inch heel shoes back then. And those are my short ones. I was relieved. 
religious and go to church on Sunday in the temple of the Lord and I found safety there. I was so deceived. I praise God that one of my fraternity brothers, a guy named Jim, started studying the Bible with me and laying out what it meant to become a follower of Christ. And when he got to Acts 2 and talked about how you had to be baptized to have your sins forgiven, I was ticked off. And I said to him, you're telling me I'm not a Christian? He says, exactly. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 6. For many in this world, baptism is just a ritual. Just a passage in your life. And yet the Bible says it's much, much more. In verse 2 of chapter 6, we read this. Paul is talking to all the Christians at Rome. He says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead for the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Last Sunday, weren't all those baptisms exciting? Amen. And you see, you weren't witnessing just a symbolic expression of somebody's faith. There are a lot of churches that teach that baptism is simply the outward sign of an inward grace. In other words, you're already saved, and now you're just getting baptized to kind of confirm it. The Bible says right here that Paul is reminding all the Romans, don't you remember the time that you died to sin? Now, we understand Jesus taught you have to be born again, amen? And if you're going to be born again, you've got to get rid of your first life in order to get a second life. And you're not going to physically kill yourself. That's not the way to go. So how do you die? The Bible says right here, in the waters of baptism, you die with Christ. You're buried with him. And then you are raised, what's it say? To live a new life. Is that incredible or not? You see, baptism is a miracle of God. And we've lost this sense of awe of the way of God. That people's lives can actually change that radically. Come on, bro. What was Jesus' vision for the church? A house of prayer for all nations. In other words, every person was to have a personal relationship with God. And then, collectively, we are brought together because of our own personal relationship with God. Literally, from all nations. And that's God's church. But we've lost our sense of awe of what church is all about. If you're sitting next to a baptized disciple, you're sitting next to a miracle. Is that awesome? Don't that send a little chill up your back? This is a miracle. Are we saying they're perfect? No. That's what makes it all the more miraculous right there. But we've lost our sense of all. We've lost our sense of the miraculous. We have been so inundated by humanism. To think that today you are coming to worship God with a bunch of miracles. Is that exciting, amen? Amen. You know, this past uh, Sunday, our contribution was amazing. I just got to commend the whole church for your incredible hearts of sacrifice. Some of you sacrificed so much, so much like that widow that put in everything she had to live on. And the Bible says right there in Jeremiah 7 that God is watching. God knows. But sadly, there were were a few of us who held back. 
Because we, we, we lost our sense of the miraculous. We lost our sense that what we were giving to was for there to be people to be baptized in Santiago, Chile. Yeah. That if we don't get the money to them, there's not going to be baptisms. We lost our sense of the miraculous that we want to put on Michael and Michelle full time so they can train to go to London, England next summer. I mean, that's why you didn't work super hard to give everything you could to serve. And of course today brings another test. We made a pledge before God. God is watching. God is real. How about it? Are we going to give? Are we going to come through with the pledge that we've said we, we're going to give to God? Or do we have some excuse that, quote, is more important? So we've got to have a deep conviction, guys. We've got to clean it out to be devout. And you clean it out to be devout, not just when you're baptized, but even after you're baptized. Because it's amazing what can begin to happen to you even after you're baptized. You know, one of the, uh, the, the pictures that I, I also enjoyed in there is uh, Cammie's picture. She's going back to Honolulu and she's a part of the church there now. But she's very open about her life. She and her husband became disciples back in the 90s. They married and then they fell away. And as of a few weeks ago, each was living with a different person. And she's very open about it. She repented. She called her husband out, tried to ask forgiveness, tried to get him to repent. I mean, it's amazing how far out there we can get. I, I still remember when uh, Kathy and Luchak came to the church for the first time. And I appreciate Kathy's openness as a sister in the Lord. She's incredible. Even though she was going to church, she was starting to go after a relationship with a man in the world. She's very open about it. She wrote about it in an article. I mean, our lives need to be transparent. See, sometimes people fall away and they totally leave the church and their life is just empty and unfulfilled. It certainly has no answer for this thing of death. Yeah. On the other hand, there are some people that continue to go to church... Because they're in the temple of the Lord and they're safe and they're all right. But I'm here to tell you, you got to clean it out to be devout. Are you with me right here? Yes. Is there anything in your life that Jesus wants out? You need to make that decision today. Because Jesus wants you to be a part of a house of prayer for all nations. Amen? Let's move on. Matthew chapter 27. In verse 38, we're picking up right in the middle of the crucifixion account. Two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Do you remember that picture in your mind? Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself! Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. Wow! Everybody heard about this prophecy. Destroy the temple and I'll build it in three days. I mean, they're mocking him on the cross. They didn't understand that he was talking about his body. And after he resurrected, that's why the disciples believed so much and were willing to go to their death. You know, in a few weeks, Elaine and I are going to be taking on off for a missionary trip. We'll be going to London, Moscow, but we're also going to Chennai, India. And uh, Chennai, India is, is an incredible place. And a brother there, Raja, called me on up. He says, brother, is there anything that you want to do? I said, you, you come up and you, you fill out the schedule as far as preaching to the church, getting with the leaders and all that. I just have one request. He says, what's that? He says, I want to go see the tomb of the Apostle Thomas. The Apostle Thomas preached the word all throughout India. And his tomb is in southern India. And, I, and, and he said, well, why, why, why in particular do I go see him? I said, well, you know, bro, my, my real name is Thomas. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that, bro. Amen. <laughs> but, I mean, 
These men believed that Jesus was the Son of God. Why? Because he resurrected from the dead. He fulfilled the prophecy. Destroy the temple. And I'll rebuild it in three days. Let's keep reading. Verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. Now, Jesus was crucified, we know this from the book of Mark, at the third hour, at 9 a.m. in the morning. Sixth hour is noontime. Now, you've got to admit, if you're over in the Middle East, it's pretty sunny there most of the time. And at noontime, if it starts getting dark, that's pretty creepy. So it's getting really dark now in the middle of it. Here are these three figures on the cross. They're on this hill called Golgotha, whose side looks literally like a skull. That's what Golgotha means, is a skull. And it's getting dark. Wow, does that send a shiver up your back right there? <laughs> Verse 46. About the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with them who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Here is this pagan soldier who sees the darkness, who hears the words of Jesus, who feels the earthquake, sees the rocks exploding, and he goes, That was the Son of God. And he held him in all. A pagan soldier. Our second apart point. <clears throat> Torn apart to reveal God's heart. What a moment there. In the darkness at three in the afternoon as Jesus cries out, It is finished. Into your hands I give my spirit. And he dies. Now, when he dies, the Bible says there's not only an earthquake. I mean, that, that sends a signal. I mean, I but look what he says right here. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Well, well let's, let's get our diagrams out again here. We want to go to... The big picture. We see the entryway, the altar, the bath, going inside. The first room, the large room, is the holy place. Then you see the curtain right there. And then behind the curtain is the most holy place where the ark is at. Now, let's... Learn a little bit about this. Turn to Exodus chapter 26. Let's read about the curtain. It's being made at this point for the tabernacle and later for the temple. Verse 31, chapter 26. Make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen with cherubim worked into it by skilled craftsmen. Hang it with gold hooks and four posts of acacia work overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasp and place the ark of the testimony behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Put the atonement cover on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Well, now if you look carefully at this drawing, the artist here did a pretty good job. Because it said, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. You can kind of see those colors right there, can't you? Here's an amazing thing. The most famous Jewish historian, Josephus, says that the curtain was four inches 
thick. It's not some flimsy little curtain that's flapping around. <laughs> it's four inch, it's like a telephone book. Wow. And the Bible's quite clear. Jesus cries out to God, it is finished. He dies. The earthquake. And the Bible says that the temple curtain is ripped from top to bottom. Not bottom to top, because that, a man would do that. Rip it like this. It was God who ripped it. Josephus adds that no two horses could have pulled apart the curtain of God. It was that thick, that sturdy. And in an instant, in a moment, God rips it in half, exposing the Holy of Holies. What happened spiritually? God is opening up for everybody to be able to go in and talk to him at the ark, at the mercy seat of God. Secondly, he's opened the curtain so he can go out into all the world. Amen. Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. In verse 7, we read, But only the high priest entered the inner room. That's the holy police. And that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people who had committed in ignorance. Now, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Now, is this awesome? By the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let's just stop right there. Go back and read Leviticus chapter 16. And you will find that once a year, the high priest was commanded by God to go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, or we call it Yom Kippur. I kind of like that name for some reason. <clears throat> and when he went in there, the first thing he would do is he would take the blood of a bull. And he would sprinkle on to the top of the ark, which was called the mercy seat. Remember the, the cover is the mercy seat. It's got two angels on it. And in between the two angels and the, the cover right here, God speaks to the high priest. The first thing the high priest was to do is to sprinkle onto the mercy seat the blood of a bull. That was for his sins and the sins of his family. Next he would go in. And he would throw onto the mercy seat the blood of a goat. But here's what had happened previous. There was not one goat that was brought to the temple for the sins of the people, but two goats. A lot was cast on which goat would be sacrificed. The goat that got the lot would be killed. His blood would then be taken into the Holy of Holies, sprinkled on the mercy seat, and the other goat would be taken outside the city and let go, representing the fact that all the sins of the people were being taken away. The Bible calls that goat the scapegoat. The scapegoat. That's what happened once a year on the day of atonement. And it's very interesting right here. He says, once you understand that Jesus' body is now the new veil, you see, 
Jesus is our mediator. Amen, guys? To be able to talk to God. He says, what are you going to do when you understand? When you understand that you can have a personal chat. You are going to draw near to God. How? Well, our bodies have been sprinkled with blood and washed with clean water. That's talking about baptism right there. And look what he says next. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. He's saying, man, do you understand what a privilege it is to be able to draw near to God? He says, that's what church is. It's a collection of all those people who come to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. How about it? Was that your thought in coming to church today? Or are you coming today because, well, it's Easter Sunday. You know, one of the things that's amazing is we get back to our text there in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 27. In keeping with our second point, torn apart to reveal God's heart. The Bible says not only was the veil torn from top to bottom. The earth shook. Rocks split. Now this would be kind of cool. You know how firecrackers kind of go boom and little shreds go a different way? When Jesus died, you see all these rocks exploding. That, that would be cranking right there. Amen, guys? Then, get this. Verse 52. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Whoa! They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city. My question is, what did they do for those two or three days? They probably got together. I don't know. <laughs> They've been dead for a while, so it's time to fellowship a little bit. <laughs> but can you imagine seeing one of the dead holy people come into the city? Oh my gosh, it's Samuel. It's Moses. I mean, that'll get you to believe. Amen, guys? Why? Because someone resurrected from the dead, and you know scientifically and medically it's impossible. And the moment you see dead people being alive, you go, I believe. <laughs> but that's the point about Jesus! But we take it so much for granted that humanism has stolen the miraculous from our hearts. You know what gets me, though? Is this pagan centurion. He saw it all. And he goes, surely. This was the son of God. You know, this, this morning we're going to be able to witness a miracle. A gentleman named Roland. Abrigo Riveras. And he was Marine. He was a pagan soldier. He was in the Marines four years. He then went to USC for four years and got a degree in accounting informational systems. In other words, he works with computers. I mean, guys. And about a year ago, and he's 30 years old now, he was in a car wreck. A car wreck in which his, his car turned over several times. In the midst of it, he just cried out to God. God, spare me and I'll seek you. He was in a coma five days. Time passed. That happened last St. Patrick's Day. And a few weeks ago, Ken Zindler was making his usual pit stop at Starbucks coffee. <laughs> And there was Roland. Amazingly as it sounds, his first study was on St. Patrick's Day just a couple weeks ago, on the year anniversary of the car wreck. And today, this once pagan soldier is now going to become a son of God and your brother in Christ. And when you see him go down in the waters of baptism, it's not just a symbol. You are seeing a modern day miracle.
The Bible says that we share in baptism in the actual death, burial, and resurrection. Why is that so important? Because when Jesus died, that's when he shed his blood. And what forgives us of our sins? But the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when he rises, he not only has all of his sins forgiven, but he now is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God lives in him. Is that awesome? Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Close out. Here are some encouraging words in verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Is that encouraging or not? You see, because of the blood of Jesus, we now can go to the Holy of Holies. We can meet with God. And our mediator is Jesus, the high priest. And the Bible says that when he was in the flesh, he had all the weaknesses that we have and we fall prone to, except he didn't sin. Is that, inc- that, that enough would make you believe he's son of God. You know, it was my spiritual birthday yesterday. And though I try not to sin every day, I get up and have my quiet time. And I don't know, just, Lord just put it on my heart. Today, Kip, go through the whole day and don't sin. That's a hard thing to do. <laughs> have to admit I messed up a couple times. But I mean, to think, Jesus went through a lifetime without sin. Is that incredible? And yet he felt the pull of the flesh just as strongly as we do. And therefore, when we're weak, when we're hurting, even when we're defeated, he understands. And he's there for us in our time of need. Have you felt weak lately? We need to go. To God in prayer. He'll give you strength. He'll give you renewed convictions to be what you need to be. You know, we're very blessed we had Mike Patterson visiting us this past week. And Mike's the campus minister at Arizona State University. And come this summer, he's going to be coming here and bringing about nine or ten other uh, college students with him. And we're going to start a new region in Long Beach. Is that going to be awesome? And uh, Mike's going to finish out his training, and he's going, he's going to become the regional evangelist down there. But Mike didn't know L.A., so I, I wanted to take him around. Ricky Chalinor is with us, and, and Lance Underhill was also with us, because Lance and Connie are going to be moving to Long Beach and be the shepherding couple there. Is that awesome? Yeah. And uh, we started on over in Redondo Beach. Says, Mike, I said, you've got to come here. You've got to go to Redondo. We, we looked out at Redondo Beach. I said, bro. There could be hundreds of baptisms right here. And you should have seen him. I, just, I could just tell him, oh, yeah, bro, that'd be awesome. Then, then I said, okay, let's go to Palos Verdes. That's a real rich part of L.A. right here. PV. And we're up there on the cliffs. And I said, you know, this is kind of a sad area right here. A few years ago, there was a USC football player that committed suicide and killed himself from here. His life was that empty. I said, but you know, Mike, that's why we want to get on every campus in Los Angeles. We want every college student to have a chance to know God. We prayed there at Redondo Beach. We prayed again on the cliffs of Palos Verdes. Then we went down to Long Beach on the Queen Mary. And we got on the deck right there, and we're looking at beautiful downtown Long Beach right there. And we prayed for the whole city. And then we went to Long Beach State. Now, if you know anything about Long Beach State, kind of its uh, most famous 
uh, marker is its athletic facility. It's a giant blue pyramid. I mean, it's gorgeous. And so we went over there. We all grabbed the pyramid. And we just prayed to the Lord that a great movement would start here at Long Beach State. And you know, I mean, you pray. And, it, and it's amazing how you stop thinking about all your problems. And your prayers even start changing from being all about you and all about your hurts and all about your disappointments and all about your... And you start praying to, uh, for other people and about other people. And there's a strengthening that actually comes by praying. And even though I was having some, some physical challenges that day, I came home exhausted but very fired up in the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, we have such a privilege to be able to talk to God in prayer. And to be able to look, not inwardly, but outwardly as Jesus did. To believe there's going to be hundreds of people baptized in the New South region. To believe that in San Diego, in a region down there, there are going to be hundreds of people baptized. What's kind of cool, as I, as I came into to church this morning, I got a text from Tim Kernan over in London, and they had three baptisms this morning. Is that awesome? I mean, these are miracles that are taking place all over the world. God is moving. And so what's our challenge? Very simply this. Clean it out to beat about. Remembering that it has been torn apart to reveal God's heart. Thank you and God bless.